Weekly, Garage Band, Garage Band Weekly, Garage Band, Garage Band Weekly. Need an answer to your question? John, do you have a suggestion? Seems to bounce in our more knowledge. I think he might have gone to Garage Band College. But he doesn't know, we'll try and find out. So join the chat and give him a shout. John. Garage Band Weekly. Garage Band Weekly. Girls, it is that time of the week. Time for Garage Band Weekly here on Studio Live today as he fixes his green screen background in real time. Yeah, that's what you get around here. That's the professionalism of this particular show. It's more of our relaxed, casual kind of show that we do here on Studio Live today. I hope you are doing well. On this week's show, we've got some news and notes for you, and we're going to ask and hopefully answer this question, and I'd like to put it out there to you, the viewing audience right now, and that is, why don't the pros use GarageBand? And I use those little quotation marks for a reason that we'll get into later when I share my opinion on why the pros don't use GarageBand for their music creation, but I'd love to get your feedback on that. So whether you're watching live or whether you're catching up on the replay, let me know. What do you think? Because it was um, it was a question raised in the GarageBand users Facebook group recently, and I thought, that's an interesting one. I, uh, I've got some thoughts. I've got some views. I've got some opinions. I'm probably going to have a rant, but I'd love to hear your views on that one. Uh, if you would like to support me and the work that I do around here, the one-stop shop, the place you need to go is uh, right on over here to studiolivetoday.com. This is the everything. You can jump into the YouTube uh, the YouTube channel and subscribe if you haven't already. You can check out my schedule of live shows. You can listen to the podcast. You can check out the gear guide, and that's a, an important thing this time of year because there's some pretty good gear specials about to happen at Amazon, Sweetwater, eBay, all the places. All the different things are there, all the groups, all the ways that you can stay in touch with me and uh, keep up to date with this wonderful community. Uh, all things Songtember is there as well. Uh, and a picture of me holding way too many audio interfaces uh, from about five years ago. You can tell by the colour and quantity of the hair. So uh, studiolivetoday.com for all of your uh, Studio Live Today needs. All right, let's jump in, shall we? Let's jump into the news and notes while you ponder the question, the very vague question of, uh, of pros, pros using GarageBand. Uh, so I've only got a couple of quick notes and things to talk about here today. Number one, I'm going to give another reminder slash warning slash slash from Guns N' Roses about iOS and iPad OS. So... <laughs> I've had a few more people reach out to me during the week saying, I updated to iOS and iPad OS 17.0.3 and insert name of thing is not working. So yeah, can I, can I just reiterate, I've been saying this since about iOS 11, I think it was the first time I started ranting on this when a lot of people went from iOS 10 to iOS 11 and a whole bunch of stuff stopped working because of all the updates and all the changes. So if I could say just a, a little reminder, don't update your iOS or your iPad OS unless there is a real significant security risk and or a feature that you really want to try out, especially if you're in the middle of a large music project or video project or anything project, then please just leave it alone. It's like a scab. If you pick at it, it's going to bleed. It's like updating your iOS and your iPad OS. If you update it before you should, you're going to at least metaphysically, metaphorically bleed because you're going to be really unhappy. That being said, 17, I've had no problems with it, but I'm a very simple creator, so I don't actually... I don't actually use a whole bunch of external plugins and external apps and external synths and external anythings. I pretty much stick with pretty basic setup. So if you're a basic B like PJ, then uh, you'll probably be totally fine. But if you you know who you are, if you're using AUM and if you're using Audio Bus and you're bu bussing in 100 different uh, apps and, and plugins, there's nothing wrong with that. But here's the problem. Not every single one of those developers that have made every single one of those is going to actually support the latest version. They're often just a little bit behind. So I would uh, I would wait. 
I would wait. Omni Collective Creativity says uh, I'm not updating to iOS 17 until I know that the voiceover bugs are fixed. And that's the thing. The, the point one is usually the biggest update and usually where a lot of things end up being fixed and uh, improved, shall we say. Uh, the, the, the first version, the .o versions, often have a few uh, hiccups and a few things. Uh, Psycho7 says, uh, I'm still a few updates behind. It's getting glitchy though, so I hope they debug the current one soon. I'm going to need it. And yeah, and like I say, it really does depend on you. This is the thing. When, when people make definitive statements, uh, I'm a little bit over it when people say, everyone must, you must, you have to. You, The rules are actually BS, aren't they? Because it depends. It depends on you. It depends on your hardware setup. It depends on the software that you're using. It depends on the device. There's like 101 different variations, which is why technology is quite complex and complicated. But uh, it's also why you can't make definitive statements. You can't just say everyone, no one. It doesn't work that way. So that's uh, that, that's my rant on uh, on iOS and iPadOS. So I highly recommend uh, just chilling, just kicking back. There's no, no rush with this sort of stuff. Uh, we got some rumours. Uh, I've dropped a link down in the description to the rumour mill, which is that new iPads were coming and now they're not. So depending which rumour you read and on which day, and this is why, again, nothing's definitive. When people come out and go, there'll definitely be new iPad minis, new iPad Airs and new base level iPads, and they're coming on, I think it was October 16 or 17, so we're, we're kind of there, and then we don't hear anything. And then, uh, is it John Gruber, uh, one of the big uh, leakers? <laughs> By the way, every time I hear the word leakers, I'm just, it, it makes me think of adult nappies or diapers. I don't know why, because I'm a, I'm a child and I have a childish mind. Um, yeah, it, it's, it, it may or may not happen. So here's the thing. Usually around October, around this time, about a month after the iPhone release, we have releases of new Macs and or iPads, depending what year the year has been. There was probably not going to be new Macs, and, and I don't think we've had the, the M2s, the M3s still pretty far away from what we've heard. The only kind of rumbling is that maybe the iMac, which hasn't actually had an upgrade from the M1, might get an M2 refresh, but we've seen neither hide nor hair of that. And uh, the big rumour, though, has been new iPads, not Pros, before you get too excited. We have the, the M2 iPad Pros uh, released recently, and they will remain the, the big Pro model for probably at least another six months until uh, 2024, I would imagine. But we haven't seen a refresh for the Mini or the Air uh, or even the, the base model iPad for about a year. So, yeah, I don't... I don't know. Um, do I do, do do I care? No. Uh, so here's the thing. I still haven't seen any use, uh, any so, uh, with the possible exception of Final Cut Pro and Logic Pro, so Apple's own software that does use quite a little bit of the processing power. Nothing's coming close. So the Pro in particular, nothing's coming close to the M1 or the M2 processor, the 8 gigabytes or 16 gigabytes of RAM. It, it's really already there so and I, it's just going to be iterative this is why again the rumor culture and the new release culture kind of pisses me off because everyone wants they're like oh it's so boring the the new iphone release it was so boring there was nothing new and it's like what do you want them to do like what what newness we've already got everything it already does everything it's going to be iterative it's going to be an evolution not a revolution the iphone was a revolution the ipad was a revolution. Every version since then has been evolving. It has been slowly just adding very small features. So if you're waiting for the big bang that is going to be something amazing and suddenly your iPad's going to be on wheels and follows you around and does your bid, I don't know. I really don't know. Yeah, some Transformers. Uh, new iPad Air and regular iPads tomorrow or next month or next year. Pick your rumor. Spot on. Exactly. It's kind of like the when I used to work in the corporate world, it's like <laughs> statistics can prove anything. 40% of people know that. Uh, so you can you can pick and choose whichever one you want to look, whichever one sells your story and, uh, and reiterates and, and reconfirms your beliefs, then go with it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's uh, let's let's move on from that. So yeah, maybe maybe not. Hello, Chris Pizzi, by the way. Hello, hello to everyone who's here. Uh, thank you for joining me. We will have a chat later. I forgot to mention if you do have questions because it's a Q and A show. It says so in the title. Uh, you can put a, a big Q. That's the wrong one. You can put a big Q in front of your comment, and uh, I will tag those 
and return to those as we go through. The only other thing I wanted to mention here in the news and notes section is uh, the GarageBand update. So we talked about this on last week's show. If you missed it, or I did a cut down version, just like a six, seven minute version that just went through all the details. Short version is the GarageBand iOS update is only available if you update to iPadOS 17 or iOS 17. It has a few bug fixes. It doesn't have anything new or shiny or flashy. So same advice applies. Stay on 2.3.14 on all your devices until you're ready to take the plunge and update to iOS and iPadOS 17 across everything. Because if you update just one device and then you open a project and save it on that, and then you go to try and open it on an older version, it will say to you, this requires a newer version of GarageBand, despite the fact that you can't update to that newer version of GarageBand because you're on iPadOS or iOS 16, not 17. So take my advice on that one. Only update when you're ready to completely take the plunge, but you're not missing out on anything, I promise you. There's really nothing in iPad OS 17 that, that I've found. There's a few little bits, but there's nothing, nothing revolution. Again, it's evolution, not revolution. That being said, I do need to update my Mac because apparently uh, the new version of, uh, what is it called? Winery, wine Country? <laughs> Mac OS Wine Country? Sonoma, isn't it? Sonoma County. They name them after counties in California because of course they do. So uh, yeah, Mac OS Sonoma getting some good reviews. In fact, it's this one. Uh, this guy here, Cold Acre, has said to me that it's getting good reviews and is pretty stable. So maybe I need to carve out space on my tiny hard drive and uh, download and install Sonoma. That's our news and notes. Time to dive in to question time. So we'll start with questions from the audience. We have but one at this stage. I'm then going to jump in and uh, talk about why pros don't use GarageBand. Uh, and then we'll, uh, we'll have time for some chat and some any additional questions at the end. So Joe and Barry Glenn ask the following question. Having uh, at last managed to change my virtual drums to MIDI, I joined the sections to copy and paste my project. Can I now put the MIDI back into sections without messing it up? Uh, yeah, yeah, you can. So let, let's just follow this through. Uh, change my virtual drums to MIDI. Yep, so I've got a video showing how you can change your drummer to MIDI drums. Uh, I joined the sections to copy and paste to my project. Yep, can I now put the MIDI back in a section without messing up? Yes, so the only caveat there, so let, let's jump over to the iPad and I'll see if I'm understanding what Joe is asking here. So uh, I won't do the full thing because it takes a little bit of time, but if you get a, a drummer and you turn it into MIDI drums, I'm actually just going to come in here to the beat sequencer and create a drum pattern just so that we can use something. Let's go in here to our acoustic, go to the Brooklyn Rock Drummer. Just record in a little bit of this. That's a kind of cool groove, isn't it? I'll just do uh, eight bars of this. All right. So that, there's our eight bars. So what Joe and Barry have done is, so from, from the drummer, you've probably brought, you probably had a bunch of stuff where it was uh, split into chunks, I would imagine. So you say you had a few chunks here like that. So you've joined these together. So if you don't know how to join, let's just come back to our view. If you don't know how to join, so if you have, if you've split it out from drummer and then you've got drums that look like this, what you can do to join them is just highlight them all, tap outside, drag them all, tap on them, tap on them again and hit the join button. And that's going to join all the MIDI together. So if you then wanted to say copy this, and then you open a new project and you paste it in. We'll just paste it into this same project. And then you're saying you want to then sort of split it up and add it to sections again. Yeah, you absolutely can. So if you had song sections here, so say we had uh, uh, four bars there, and uh, then we'll add in another section. We'll just duplicate this out. So say you wanted to put, this, is, this was your project. We'll just go back to the all sections. And it's automatically, because when you duplicate, it duplicates the sound. So we'll just do that. So we will delete out that. So say you have these. Um, oh, see, now I've messed that up. We'll go back. 
So if you had all these here, then yeah, you can you can move them around. The only caveat here is that sometimes when you split, if there's a MIDI note that goes across the two and you split it, it'll create two. So the only caution that I'd, I'd give you when you're messing around with MIDI like this is that if you split a note right in the middle, it'll create two versions of that note. So I'll give you an example here. So if we just solo this first track. So because all these hits are happening all within the same bar and within the same section, you're fine. And where we've split it here, we've split it between two things. If we split here instead, for whatever reason you wanted to split it right in the middle of a note, then it's going to do this. So it's actually, in this case, it's cut that off. So it's uh, probably not done too much damage there. And, and drums, it won't be too much of a problem. It, it, in fact, it's only, let's just see, we'll split these ones here. Yeah, so it's it's removing it from there, from the start of that one. So it's uh, it, with some things, when you split it, it'll actually create two notes. With this one, it's just... Uh... So it actually won't be too many too many problems uh, using drums because your drum hits usually don't need that length of the MIDI note. Uh, but I've seen people do that where you're splitting up, say, a synth part or a pad or a piano part, and it's making it sound all weird because you're splitting between uh, in the middle of a note. So just make sure any of your splits and stuff are outside of that. Hopefully that's uh, along the lines of what you've been asking for there. Uh, Psycho7 says, I uh, find they stop the note and won't play through when you split them. Yeah, you, you, it comes across some, some weird stuff. So just when you're splitting, uh, again, when you're in your iPad here, uh, when you're in GarageBand, just make sure that your split point is all completely outside of your notes. So when you're splitting like that, you'll be absolutely fine. If you split right down the middle of a note, then yeah, it tends to give you dramas. It'll either move, remove it or do some wackiness. So there you go. Maybe you should leave it. And that's the thing. You probably don't even need to. If it's, if it's pasted in there, um, I, I wouldn't bother splitting it back up again if it's fine. If, if you need to, like maybe leave it unless you need to. Um, and yes, you can, of course, um, you can add the note back in indeed. So you can then go in here and actually edit this and then add it back in. So go into your go into your piano roll here, and if it was to there, you could just spread it out. Actually, no, you can't, because you've got a split point. You'd have to add it in. So up the top there, turn that on, and then add them back in. So there's options. There is options. Uh, yeah, Psycho7 is over on the Facebook. We're multi strano <laughs> I forget that we're on Facebook as well sometimes, and I get I get surprised as well. I look at the replay, and then I see these um, these comments on Facebook, and I'm like... Oh, okay. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> it's confusing. Confusing for me. Let's jump in here. Yeah, it's okay. No need to apologize for you. Uh, look, um, whether you are a part of the Alphabet universe or the Meta universe, uh, it's not really a, it's not really much of a difference these days. They, they all want to be each other, don't they? Let's be honest. They're all, um, they're all advertising companies. Love you. Love you, my, my overlords. <laughs> <laughs> Don't bite the hand that feeds you, John. Don't bite the hand that feeds you. Okay. Uh, let's, I've just realized my iPad is unplugged. <laughs> I'm going unplugged, so I'm uh, without power. Let's dive into our feature topic, shall we? So I threw it out there to ask you at the start, and I'll ask it again here for those that weren't in the, the chat at the start. Why don't the pros use GarageBand? And we're going to start by answering this question, because... Uh, to answer a question, you have to define the question, don't you? You have to define what a pro, what a professional means. So based on the usual understanding of professional, it is not anything to do with quality. It is to do with doing something to be paid. So a amateur athlete is one who can compete in the Olympics or, or is a college student because they don't get paid. A professional athlete is anyone who gets paid, whether you are Connor McDavid getting paid $10 million a year or you're sadly like a local football player here in uh, Adelaide getting play, paid $15,000 a year, you're still a professional. Now, there's, there's things like semi-professional, but basically anything that has the word professional in it means you got to get paid. So guess what? The vast majority of those in this community are professional musicians. Why? Because if you've taken my advice and you've released your music to Spotify and Apple Music and all the places using DistroKid, you're getting paid some royalties. And when you have that first one cent of royalties from your music, 
guess what? You've been paid for your music and you are now a professional musician. However, the way that we kind of look at this as a professional is someone who is either full time as a musician or as a creator or an engineer or who is experienced. So why don't experienced music creators use GarageBand would probably be a better way to look at it. Um, and we've got some, some folks have already uh, already put some comments here. Omni Collective Creativity says, GarageBand is seen as a beginner's toy by pros, like most things, like Pro Tools, Ableton, FL Studio, big boy doors like them. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Joe and Barry Glenn say, search me. Why not? <laughs> uh, Mark Bro says, I think there's a lot more pros using GarageBand than we think, but most will sketch and develop in GarageBand and then record in a proper studio. Studio time costs big dollars and GarageBand is free. Absolutely. So all of those are great points and very much uh, in line with what I'm doing. Uh, it, yes, I, I did... I didn't really do this on purpose, Jade, but it's interesting, isn't it? Because the band, the Gorillas, not the Gorillas, Gorillas, uh, Damon, e Dame, Damon Eamon, is that his name? I can never remember. I always remember the Gallagher's, uh, but uh, the dude from Blur created Gorillas, and a lot of what they've created is in GarageBand, which is uh, kind of kind of ironic, isn't it? Not ironic, but coincidental. Yeah, <laughs> it's the uh, it's the Alanis Morissette version of ironic, don't you think? So yeah, they, those are all really good points that you have all already made. Uh, and uh, yeah, so Sylvie says that she's a professional today. She released her first song on District Kid today. Congratulations to Sylvie Drapeau. Send me a link to, to the song. I'll, I'll give it a listen because I know you sent me something recently. But yeah, when, when you release something, like I don't mind if you bug me. A lot of people reach out to me and say, hey, I, I wrote a song. Can you sing it? Can you produce it for free? Uh, unfortunately, I have to say no to that. But if someone in this community is releasing music, let me know. Uh, yeah, because we, we want to check it out. We want to check it out. So what, what's my views on this? I'll start ranting and then you folks can uh, can chime in as we go through. Secret Legacy says, I got $1.99 from iTunes in 2008. Somebody bought my release, not family either. A few more options these days. Yeah. Uh, in fact, I was thinking about that, uh, Costa, today because I was, I, was, I was reflecting upon Song Temba and uh, the OGs will know, Thomas and Jade and folks will know that the first Song Temba, part of the deal was I would buy everyone's song. So because we had, what, maybe 30 ish 40 people in that first year that actually released a song i said i'll buy your song on itunes so so you can be a professional musician you'll get at least one sale on itunes uh, what happened over the next five years is that buying music on itunes doesn't really happen anymore i could still do it like you can still release your single and people can still buy it but it's so much more about streaming these days and yeah if you're going to sell your music uh, in all honesty Bandcamp's probably a more engaging and better option to actually do direct selling to fans of your music. So, yeah. Uh, if there are pros out there who turn their nose up at GarageBand, then they are fools and only limiting, exactly, only limiting the ways to make music. Agreed. And uh, I'll probably mention this uh, up front. Uh, RTB says, I still record with GarageBand, then transfer everything to Logic. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, I'll mention this up front that, look, I, I am biased. I'm going to say a lot of things that are in my opinion and in my experience. And the thing is, that a lot of people that are pros that don't record in GarageBand are also biased. So there's a lot of biases going on in the, the world of music creation. And I'll talk a little bit about that because something called sunk cost bias that is a lot of part of this. But the, the first thing that came to my mind with GarageBand, already been mentioned a couple of times, is perception. Yeah, ever since 2004, where John Mayer and Steve Jobs got up on stage and one of the first things Steve Jobs said when he announced GarageBand was, it's the music creation software for non-musicians. And we've called it Garage Band. Now, those two things in tandem, these days you think, oh, that didn't really mean much. But trust me, that meant a lot. When you were watching that at the time, it was like, oh, I even remember, I wasn't even an Apple user at the time. And I remember finding out about this Garage Band thing. And I'm like, oh, yeah, Garage Band, like hacking around in the garage with your mates and yeah, not, not really taking it seriously. So the name has often, uh, is often a problem. 
and the perception that it is a toy. It is for amateurs and beginners. It is not for professionals to use. So definitely uh, something that's uh, that's been a struggle. Uh, still, people sometimes say the name about FL Studio. Seems like the pros only use the door of the person expressing that opinion. Yeah. And the fact that FL Studio is Fruity Loops. Yeah. How many people? <laughs> I laugh at it because whenever someone, you know, makes a fire beat and sends it to me, it's like, yo, I made this awesome fire beat in FL Studio. I'm like, you use Fruity Loops. That's awesome. And I know I've made that reference a bunch of times and I'll probably stop. Maybe. Eventually. Never. Uh, Cakewalk Next looks like it's very influenced by GarageBand and I released six tracks with it professionally. Very cool. I like it, Chris. Yeah, Cakewalk have done some weird and interesting things, haven't they? And I think Cakewalk um, suffers a little bit from the same thing as GarageBand because it's look, it was looked at as like an entry-level door, even though it was one of the first and one of the most advanced digital audio workstations ever. It's, um, yeah, it, it, it does have a little bit of that perception. Basically, Pro Tools wins the naming conventions because it's in the bloody name, isn't it? Pro Tools. I'm a pro and a tool. So what do I... No, don't worry. Sorry. I'm going to get all the Pro Tools people on my back. Lidshaw, I love you, buddy. <laughs> uh, Cakewalk used to be the interface. Yeah, exactly. Um, it, it was based around the hardware, and it was kind of the first MIDI sequencer as well. A lot of uh, digital music was uh, was MIDI sequencing. Uh, Jade says, I love it when I meet other musicians, engineers who find out I use an iPad to make music, and they treat me like some kind of amateur. Then we compare music, and there sucks. Yeah, the proof is in the pudding. No one has ever listened to us. No one apart from us music nerds listens to music and goes, I wonder what door that was created on. <laughs> it's like when you look at a cool painting. If you're not a painter, you don't go, I wonder what um, what grade of canvas was used and what type of oil paint, because I only used, I don't even know a brand of oil paint. But yeah, you get my gist. Unless you're in the trenches, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter at all. Uh, yeah, it is. It, so, yeah, if you haven't followed the whole cakewalk thing, uh, talk to Mike over at Creative Source. I've, there's been some weird sort of splitting out and changing up and doing things of uh, of cakewalk in recent times. Uh, how can I turn down my garage band in result? No matter what I do, it's too loud. Loudness penalty, Jade showed us. Oh, uh, Andy Cal, uh, I'll, I'll tag this one. We'll come back to this after we've talked uh, this. So I'll tag that as a question to chat about afterwards. Uh, yeah, if you've tried the, um, <laughs> tools are only an issue for tools. If you've uh, tried the loud noise thing, then, um, try it again, uh, I guess. It, that's the only way I've, I've, wor I've worked out that is guaranteed to actually turn it down. And if you need to, I can send you my project, which has me screaming at the start, which I know will drop it down around about 6 dB and give you the headroom that you need. Number two on my why pros don't use GarageBand is uh, hardware support. So especially for the iOS version, and by the way, I should have defined, we're talking Mac and iOS here because, I mean, iOS probably suffers even more. So if you're using a GarageBand Mac versus Logic Mac, there's, you know, there's a difference, but it's not a big gap. As soon as people think, oh, you, you're doing it on your phone or your tablet, you're you some kind of crazy person. Yeah. So hardware support is something that a lot of people worry about. And look, to a certain extent, this is true because GarageBand doesn't support, especially on iOS, it doesn't support a lot of really high-end interfaces. So I guess if you're a professional and you were running, you wanted to run like a FireWire interface from back in the day, like an eight-channel or 16-channel FireWire interface, that's not going to work. Anything that requires a driver that's not got a class compliant mode is not going to work, at least on iPad. And GarageBand itself doesn't have great support for, uh, it's got a little basic MIDI learn stuff on the Mac, but on iPad, you got no MIDI learn, you got no ability to program things in. It's all very basic and very straightforward, which is kind of how it was designed. And we'll get to that as we go through here. But yeah, there's definitely uh, less hardware support when it comes to GarageBand than perhaps other DAWs like Pro Tools and Logic and others, uh, which leads nicely into number three, which is plugin support. So a lot of people will say, I don't want to use GarageBand because it doesn't support a lot of the high-end plugins that I use, the sample libraries that I use. If you're doing big symphony work and you're using big libraries, terabytes and terabytes of sounds, GarageBand is not the best at managing those, even on the Mac. And on iOS, it is an absolute nightmare to manage that, to be perfectly honest. As much as I love GarageBand, as much as I'm biased towards it, uh, yeah, it, the fact that you've got this one folder that you store any files that you want to bring in and out, you can't separate them out into different folders, 
yeah, that's a challenge. The fact that you can only use AUV3 plugins and interrupt audio, you can't use any AAX, you can't use any VSTs, that's obviously a problem. So, yeah, professionals that use a lot of plugins and rely on those plugins to create their music, yeah, they're, they're going to need something more than GarageBand, which is fine. By the way, if I didn't say that already, use what works for you. It's fine. Just don't tell other people what they can and can't use. You can give recommendations, sure, and you can share your experience, but don't tell other people what they can do. It doesn't. It doesn't go down well. We don't appreciate it. <laughs> uh, number four, uh, the mixer. So I think Mark, it might have been Mark Bro or other folks that mentioned this in the, the uh, Facebook group. But yeah, when you're mixing here in GarageBand, you're flying blind, aren't you? So you've got your drums here. What level are these at? We don't know. They're at about three quarters. And when you turn things up and down, you don't get a really clear view of that. You've got no master meter, so you can't see what's going on here. Now, GarageBand on Mac is a little better. You've got a little bit more control, but you still don't have a really nice mixer interface. If you, you look at something like Logic Pro, by comparison, either on the Mac or on iOS, you do have a really nice mixer that can actually show you all the things you need. Where's my Logic folder? <laughs> I'm still not used to Logic uh, iCloud Drive, Logic Pro for iPad. There we go. Uh, let's just jump into my September track here, um, GBW. So yeah, you, you have the ability to have this and especially because a lot of professionals have used both digital audio workstations and real gear, they're used to a view that looks more like this, that is a selection of channels with channel strips, with faders, with buses, with sends and receives, and that's what they want to use to create their music. They want to be able to have a mixer. So the reason that, again, professionals care about this more than someone that's just starting out is a lot of people don't even think about this. A lot of people that are just happy creating in GarageBand, don't, you don't know what you don't have, right? So you don't know what you're not missing. If you've never used a console, if you've never used a hardware mixer, it doesn't actually matter to you uh, and you can still balance out your sounds here there's also hacks and workarounds and ways to do this you can use the eq uh, eq volume hack you can use automation because once you actually add automation here to this track why can't i get to there see i've forgotten i've lost my garage band mojo i've uh, forgotten how to get my automation here <laughs> i don't want to duplicate it uh, I've, oh, that's weird I don't remember there being that weird little side menu there. But yeah, so you can go to automation and then you suddenly will see you've got measurements. So look, there's ways, there's workarounds. And that's the thing about GarageBand is there are ways to do things, but it's just a little bit clunkier than, than it is on other DAWs. Uh, Psycho says, I use an old door that has normalization as an option. Good for mastering, but the low end sucks. I love GarageBand final low end. It's a catch 22. Yeah, and we'll, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about normalization in just a jiffy, shall we? Yeah. Uh, I alluded to it there, but GarageBand itself doesn't have buses and sends, so sends and receives. It has a kind of workaround for, for things like delay and reverb. So if you've used GarageBand, you'll know that as well as your track effects, you've also got these master effects. So you can set up one reverb and one delay bus for everything. So you just set it here and set it here. And it's kind of like having a couple of uh, auxiliary channels that you can then send a certain amount of your delay or your echo and your reverb to that channel. If you compare that to something like Logic Pro or a more high level DAW, you can see here I can set up multiple buses. I've only got two on here anyway, because I'm, again, a bit basic. I'm a bit mid yeah, the kids are saying mid now. It's just, I, I can't keep up. Uh, so yeah, you can send a little bit of a bunch of tracks to those buses and uh, it works well for you. So buses and sends another one. Compatibility is a big one. So being compatible with other people. And the reason I mentioned this is not only compatibility for you and, and your work, but cross compatibility. So someone mentioned before that, you know, going into a 
quote unquote real studio costs a lot of coin and it does yet if you sort of worked on some stuff and you've got some synth patches and pads and things that you wanted to bring into a project if you've already got a pro tools project with all those stems with all your settings with all your plugins you can zip that sucker up throw it on a disc take it into the studio hand it to the engineer they can load it up and in a couple of seconds they've got everything exactly as you had it when you were writing your demo and then you can go ahead and start tracking and recording if you've used GarageBand, yeah, look, again, there's ways, there's workarounds. You can stem them out, you can export them all as WAV files and then bring them all back in. But it's just not as convenient as having, that's why, the, that's why industry standards exist. Pro Tools is an industry standard, uh, kind of always has been in the digital realm and probably always will be, just because it's kind of like, we have to wait, wait another 30 or 40 years for all the Pro Tools gurus to leave us and then maybe something else will take its place but at the moment if you're in a recording studio in nashville they're running the pro tools rig and it's kind of no way about it so if you want to be compatible with the pros then you also need to use pro tools uh the hand holding in garage band this is what a lot of people say to me that they aren't a fan of I kind of am a fan of this. I, I've, I've been on record as saying this, that I love that in GarageBand, when you want to add a piano track, you come here to the big keyboard and you tap on the big keyboard and you're immediately playing a keyboard. I kind of love that. I know a lot of people don't. I love that I can hit the big red record button up the top here and I'm recording. And everything is just simple and it's there and that's all there is to it. You don't have to arm tracks. You don't have to think about your, your inputs and your outputs. You don't have to think about your monitoring setup. You literally just go, hmm, I think this needs some guitar. So you tap the big button and you press guitar or you press drums or you press synth or you press strings or you press bass. Whatever you want to do. Like I want I want some Koto in this sucker. <laughs> And then you go to there. So, yeah, I think that the fact that GarageBand kind of holds your hand puts some people off big time. And the biggest put off is things like the audio processing. So the fact that there's no way you can tell GarageBand to not process your audio, to not normalize or not to compress your audio to get it to zero dB, that's kind of a pain in the ass. And a lot of people that are, even people like me, I probably would use garage if GarageBand had a master fader master volume fader and you could turn off auto normalization which are two very simple changes i would have thought then just like GarageBand mac does then i would probably use GarageBand ios for pretty much everything the reason that i like logic pro is for mixing and mastering it is just so much better for recording i actually still prefer GarageBand because just to set up a new track my brain's been so programmed into GarageBand land that I can do it here now. I can remember to go. Okay, gotta go to the plus track in here. And uh, then you gotta uh, wait. Where are drums? I don't want. I don't want drama. I want drums. Are oh, they under MIDI? Yeah. Okay. Oh, what? What? I uh, gotta add an audio patch. Where's my guitar amps? Oh, I've gotta add the audio patch first, and then go to the plugins and find guitar amps. So everything just takes an extra step or two. Uh, which again will will come in time because I will get more familiar with it over time which brings us to our next uh, topic here which is familiarity so being familiar with something is really important and a lot of folks who are professionals uh, we're talking professional engineers here and professional producers if you went to music school and you learned how to music you music on pro tools you didn't music on logic pro you didn't music on GarageBand. you might have in your spare time in your back room but at school you were learning pro tools and that's again why a lot of professionals these days are using Pro Tools because they learnt on Pro Tools, they studied Pro Tools, that's what was used in their classes and in their schools. And then when they got out into the re real world and went to a real, went to intern at a real studio, guess what? They had a big Pro Tools rig there. So the familiarity, and this is where uh, it, it's related to a, a term I mentioned earlier, which is sunk cost bias. Has anyone heard of sunk cost bias? Yeah, so sunk cost bias means that you are biased by how much money you have put into something. If you've ever spoken to someone that loves a particular thing, they always use a particular thing. It could be Android versus Apple. It could be Windows versus Mac. 
because they've sunk a lot of money into that. Like the sunk cost bias of someone that uses Apple, especially the iOS ecosystem, is guess what? I've sunk a lot of money into the apps on my iPhone. If I had to rebuy all the apps on my iPhone on an Android device, that's a pain in the ass. And it's the same for people that are set that are using Pro Tools, that are using a particular type of DAW. You got a lot of sunk cost. And remember, cost is not only just the physical money folding paper in your hand cost, it's also the time. There's almost, you can almost call it sunk time bias. If you spend a lot of time playing in Pro Tools for, for all of your life, why would you learn something new? Why would you go out there and try something different when you already know it? And that's why, unfortunately, the, the negative side, there's nothing wrong with that, by the way. It's absolutely fine. If you've, if you've set yourself up and you're familiar with it and you know it at like the back of your hand and you're creating great music in it, why would you change? Again, people think that I want people to use GarageBand. I want people to take a step back. Why are you encouraging people to use something that's inferior? Nah, I'm not at all. I'm just saying that if all you need is GarageBand, then stick with GarageBand. <laughs> Why would you confuse? Why would you make your life more complicated? Life is already too complicated. You don't need to make it any more complicated, in my humble opinion. Uh, Thomas says, the simplicity that uh, and intuitiveness of GarageBand is probably the best feature, really. Yeah, it invites you to be creative. Great way to put it. Uh, yeah, if an easier tool is available, why not utilize it? Mark Bro says, a hand-holding is fantastic when you start with GarageBand uh, or start a quick project. It tends to get in the way of when you want to dive in further. Exactly. And that's why a lot of people, even pros, will use GarageBand as their sketch pad, as their idea pad. And the good thing is, for us Apple fan people, now that we have Logic Pro on both Mac and iOS, it gives you a place to go with that. So if you do want to dive in, if you're like, this is cool, but I'd love to put an automated phasing flange across this, and you're like, I know I can do it in GarageBand, but it's going to take like three steps and three different tracks. I can just throw this whole project into Logic Pro, throw on a phaser, chuck the automation of that effect, send it left and right, and Bob's your uncle. So yeah, agree with that one. Uh, yeah, user-friendly. Why not? Uh, Thomas says, uh, I'm just thinking the time it takes to go from zero to at least the bones of a song is probably the shortest with GarageBand. Yeah, exactly. And yeah, use use what works for you. Exactly right. You do you, boo. You do you, in my opinion, in my humble opinion. Uh, where are we at? A couple more to go. Quality. The quality question. So it's kind of related to the perception, but a lot of people think that the quality of the music that you produce in GarageBand is inferior. Now, this has a little bit of truth to it. The reason I say that is that GarageBand originally, both on Mac and iOS, was 44.1 kilohertz, 16-bit audio. They only updated to 24-bit on the Mac, I think, around the early 2010s, and on iOS in around 2018. Uh, so it, it was it was actually inferior quality audio at a lower sampling rate. And on iOS for GarageBand, you can still only set it to 44.1 kilohertz, 24-bit sampling rate. So you don't have the opportunity to increase that. Now, remember, CDs are 44.1 kilohertz, 16-bit. And if you're old school like me, you think that CDs sound just fine. I'm, I'm pretty happy with the quality. So I'm not running out there to get 120, 192 kilohertz sampling rates and 32-bit floating point and therefore giant file sizes because I don't really think it's required. It's not, it's not, a, it's not a requirement, not a prerequisite for the sort of music. But if you do want that, if you're an absolute audiophile, I get it. Maybe you want Pro Tools or maybe you want to use Logic Pro or something more high-end because you want to have that higher quality audio. Outside of that, the other thing is around the hardware. So yes, if you want really good quality external hardware, like a real top-end preamp that costs uh, $2,000 uh, that needs drivers to run, like an audio interface that uh, requires drivers, then yeah, you, you need a higher-end piece of gear, uh, piece of software for that. So I get it. That, but what I hear more than anything is someone that's that's using their Focusrite Scarlett 2i2, plugging that into a Pro Tools rig and thinking they're going to get better sound than plugging that same Focusrite Scarlett 2i2 into an iPad or an iPhone or a Mac. And again, it's digital. So it's doing an analog to digital conversion. It's taking your analog signal and it's converting it into ones and zeros that your computer or your device can understand. And then it's playing those back to you. Now, there's a little bit, again, a little bit of truth to that, that some of the playback engines might be enhanced or might do different things in, in other 
DAWs, but for the most part, it's ones and zeros. It's it's numbers. It's just computer code. Once you have a digital wave file that you've created, it all comes down to the quality of your converters, the analog to digital converters, and the preamp that you're using, uh, and then it, it's digital. So it's not like an analog thing. I think people people thought that the difference was like four track to like 16 track two inch reel that you'd have in a studio. Whereas that doesn't actually make sense because digital it's like ones and zeros, ones and zeros. It's not crappy quality compact cassette tape versus giant reel. Uh, it, it's, it's not the same, but I get it. I understand why uh, people do come in and say, ah, oh, the quality is going to be worse. Hello, Metalhead Hippie. And hello, hairbrush microphone. Uh, I was a big music memos guy. I still use it on my iPhone, never deleted it. Sad they stopped so forth because it was actually pretty fun. Actually, that's a good question. Do I still have it uh, here on my iPad, my 2022 iPad? I do. I, I agree with you. If you don't know music memos, I don't want to disappoint you too much. You, you can't use it. But um, <laughs> music memos was a, a way to capture ideas. And uh, I'll just jump off here in case... Because sometimes the ideas... Oh, yeah, I've still got a whole bunch of ideas in here. None of them are called my address. That's good. <laughs> the voice memos I have to check because it has the address. So the way this worked is that you could create an idea. So here's an acoustic jam that I did. And what it would do, as you can see there, it would work out the chords that you're playing and it would put it out here on a grid and then you could add some very basic bass and some very basic drum sounds. And it was just a cool little sketch pad. And it was so weird because it was it was before AI and before machine learning and before everything, it did an okay job. Something like this now would absolutely crush. You could automate all of this and it would be a great little sketch pad. But um, yeah, Apple abandoned it. They said, no, we will no longer be supporting music memos. So you now can't download it. Unless you've downloaded it before, you can't download it now. Um, so yeah, if you've got it there, go go to your, um, hello Trevor Bear, go to your, your app store. And uh, if, if you can download it, it'll be there. Uh, by the way, if you've, if you're not aware of this, let's just show you, let's give you a quick, a quick tip here. I've got to remember where it is. Do, 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 do. Um, see, I haven't done this in a really long time. Uh, I've got videos out about how to do this, but uh, there it is, purchased. Um, so I just need to go into here. So there is, there is a house. There is a section here. If you go to the App Store, you go to your profile, you go to My Purchases, everything that you've ever purchased is here. Uh, and if you've downloaded it before, if it's on your device, it'll have open. If you've ever downloaded it before, so if I really want to get back, Tippy My Talking Animals <laughs> or Horse Riding Tales of My Pet Life, I can hit that cloud button and it'll download here. So this is a great place to look if you've got apps in the past that are no longer supported, so they're no longer in the app store. You'll usually, apart from a few cases, you'll usually be able to uh, download them from here. If you want to find specifically ones not on the iPad, you can tap that one there. And I think, I think there's even, a, yeah, there's a search function at the top here. So if I go Final Touch, for instance, actually that's that's on here. There you go. So if you'd, if you'd had Final Touch before, even though they don't support it anymore, and you've got a new iPad and it's not on there, you can actually come into there, search for it, and then download it. So yeah, little little hint for, for young players, uh, if you want that. Uh, Apple Voice Notes, 499 for music memos features. Uh, really? Yeah, yeah. Uh, not the Apple way. I know. They canned it. They canned it. Uh, yeah, thank you, Hippie. See, Hippie, Hippie knows the things you should ask. Uh, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm a bad YouTuber sometimes. I forget to say, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, folks. So, yeah, if you're getting some, getting some value or just having some fun chat and garage band with me, uh, throw the thumbs up our way. The final thing I wanted to talk about this is reputation. Now, this is a fun one because I think Jade mentioned it before and uh, I've had similar experiences with people. So I have I do a little bit of work, very, very probably need to do some more now that uh, 
certain things have changed within YouTube and their monetization, which is a constant uh, challenge. Uh, I probably need to do a little bit more of this, but I used to do some mixing and mastering and producing work. And a lot of it I do in GarageBand. And a lot of my community, a lot of the people that would actually hire me to do producing and to, to mixing and, and uh, help them with their songs would were in GarageBand too. So it was no big deal. But I have come across some folks that, that have heard my music or that know what I do. And then that they just have this assumption that, oh, yeah, I, I know you use GarageBand on your channel, but you don't really use that for real music. Like, they, they assume that this is like a facade. And I've actually, like, I, I pull back a curtain and there's like a Pro Tools rig with a Mac Pro in the corner. Uh, that's not the case. <laughs> so I have had people that have said, oh, can you do this? And I'm like, yeah, 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 yeah. I use GarageBand. And they're like, Wait, what? You use GarageBand? Oh, no, oh, then don't worry about it then. I don't. I want a professional sound. I don't want GarageBand. Oh, if, you, if you're not going to use a professional door, uh, then I don't want to work with you. So, yeah, there's definitely a reputation thing. And especially, especially if someone walks in and you're rocking GarageBand on an iPad, people are like, wait a minute. What's all this then? This is, this is amateur hour. This is not a professional setup. Yet, again... I could, I could have the same audio interface with the same microphones plugged in if it just looked like a, a fancy, shiny Mac. In fact, I could probably project my iPad onto a screen and just pretend it's a Mac or just change the colors or something to make it look like it was a different DAW and people would be like, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I assure you I do not have said secret studio. Uh, and it's true, the proof is in the pudding. So, um, yeah, it, it all comes down to what you're actually producing at the end of the day. Ah, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's an interesting topic and uh, look I, I try not to I try not to talk about this from a, a place of you know frustration and bias. It can be frustrating, but here's the thing. Uh, I've talked about this before. We'll, we'll, I'll finish on, on this point as well. When you talk about reputation, when you talk about professionalism and sunk cost bias and people thinking that their things better than your thing, remember that someone who is a true professional, someone who is actually doing this as their paid full-time gig, they don't got time to tell you what not to do. Sure, maybe they'll be nice enough to give you some advice, but they're probably working their ass off creating music and creating amazing music, and they probably don't even know or care what they're using or what you're using. They're like, I use this because this works for me, and I create music. I've, I've mentioned this before, but uh, if you ever want to get inspired and feel good about what you do, watch the Masterclass. I know it's expensive, but from Hans Zimmer. Hans Zimmer is one of my favorite uh, movie composers, and Hans Zimmer talked about this, and he said... He's like, look, I use all this stuff because I'm an old man and this is how I work. I mean, funnily enough, he actually uses logic. He uses logic on a MacBook for a lot of his like ideas and sketching and things. But he's like, I'm an old man. And he said, and I completely expect that the next generation of film scorers and film composers uh, is going to be some kid with a laptop or some kid with an iPad. Like, and that's the thing. He's a professional and he's not threatened. The vast majority of people who will come at you, who will look down on you, who will talk down to you because you use GarageBand or because you use an iPhone or iPad to create music, are not really creating a lot of great music. Because if they were, they would not have the time to be little you, to hang out on forums, to slag you off, to tell you about their 34 years of engineering experience. They would just sit down, shut up and get on with creating music. So keep that in mind. The next time that someone, you feel like getting into a heated argument with someone or you're feeling a little bit down because someone's uh, just giving you crap because you use a toy, you're using GarageBand, the proof's in the pudding. Are you having fun? Are you creating music? Yes, yes. Uh, they're probably not. They're probably going home and sitting on a, a, a milk crate eating beans from a can because they spend all their money on the latest Focal headphones and plugins. I don't know. I don't know, man. Uh, we've got. To, uh, has anyone taken a look at Pro Tools Sketch for iPad? I tried it. And it wasn't for me. Uh, but beat makers like, like like it. Pro Tools for iPad soon. Logic paving the way. Yeah, I don't know. Pro Tools for iPad. I wouldn't be excited by it. But uh, never been a Pro Tools guy. Uh, Logic's hard enough for me. <laughs> try to learn. <laughs> try to learn how to adapt GarageBand uh, to to Logic Pro. It's a challenge. Uh, people compare sometimes GarageBand like a Fisher Price toy. Makes me upset uh, because that ignorance uh, is no good for me. And yeah, exactly. Uh, and, and look, hopefully, what I just said there, Sylvie, gives you some. Um, yeah, 
give, give you pause to think about where they're coming from. Uh, again, I like to psychoanalyze people and things probably a little bit too much to my detriment. But when I think about it, yeah, I can't, I can't get any other outcome in my head except that the people that are putting you down and the people that are saying you're using a toy for using GarageBand uh, probably re- have really low self-esteem and are probably really lacking in confidence about their own music. And the only thing they can hang their hat on is that they're using a better DAW than what you are. Are they creating better music though? Usually not. In my experience, nine times out of 10, occasionally someone can be a giant arrogant dickhead and still create great music. I mean, look, the Gallagher brothers. But most of the time in in our communities, uh, I say it again and again, every time I play songs on Your Music Live, if someone's description says, oh, this is the greatest thing ever, you people are going to totally vibe to this fire beat, I'll play it. I'm like, eh, it's fine. And then someone's like, uh, I made this song. I poured my heart and soul into it. Um, I hope you like it. If you have the chance to play it, that'd be great. Thank you. And I'm like, click. And I'm like, whoa, I'm blown away by it. So yeah, almost without fail, the more bravado and the more people complain about things and tell you and talk down to you, the less confidence they have and the less quality stuff they're actually doing. Because if they were... They would just let that do the talking and they wouldn't have time to be messing around in forums and making people feel bad. Uh, Corona Wire says, I enjoy recording engineer stuff, not so much. Rather spend that time on the stuff I like. Uh, It's all about the song. And that's the thing, the hand-holding we talked about with GarageBand, that's perfect for you because it does. It helps you out. It holds your hand and it will helps you create music and you don't need a lot of that behind. And if you do need a little bit of help, that's what I'm here for. That's what Jade's here for. We can, we can just give you the little bits of advice to kind of take you from that more amateur sound to a professional sound without having to have all the bells and whistles and all the know-how. Again, because GarageBand does actually help you with that. All right, that was a lot, I know, but it's always a, it's an interesting topic and it's always fun to hang out with you folks and have a chat. We've got about five minutes left, uh, so please, uh, if you've got any final questions, just chuck a big Q in front of your questions. I'm happy to answer anything that you have, um, anything that's on your mind, just go ahead and uh, throw it here in the chat. And uh, I'm actually going to answer a question, so um, I'm sure he won't mind, but our friend R Times 2 had an issue where he's moved from an iPad to an iPad Pro from Lightning to USB-C. He's had to buy a new cable to connect up his iRig device, and now when he's recording, he's hearing pops and crackles in the playback. Not in the recording, but in the monitoring, in the playback. Now, there's a few things I just wanted to mention here quickly that can be causing this. If you're having the same sort of trouble, um, and I know Jade's covered this as well so there's a few few things that you check i check first of all firstly the cable now uh, our times two says he's checked the cable it's a genuine iRig cable so it should be fine and yeah going from usb to usb c and if you're getting those cracks and popples 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 just made that up now uh it, it, it could be the cable but digital usually not the second thing and this is one of the most common ones is sample rate issues so the sample for whatever reason uh in ios in particular there's kind of two common sample rates 44.1 and 48 kilohertz and i know that i've had problems with cubases for instance with this and i know jade's had similar problems where if you're using two different apps or even a plug-in in an app sometimes that clash between the 44.1 and the 48 kilohertz sample rate can cause these weird artifacts these weird clicks and pops in your playback so check in on that one too number three is your volume so make sure that your volume's not up too much you're not actually getting distortion clicks and pops that can be at the sort of the top end of your volume uh, drivers i mean that's not an issue if you're on ios but if you're on uh, if you're on a mac or a pc uh, always check your drivers because sometimes uh, older drivers can cause problems and um the, the final one is and, and what fixes it a lot of the time because it's related to all those things the other apps and the sample rate is closing all apps and turning off background app refresh. If you don't know how to do that, Google it. But if you if you go to your search settings, in fact, we can probably do it here. Um, if, if you're recording, there's a couple of things that I recommend you do. First of all, uh, go into airplane mode. So I won't do it here, but tap on this one. If I did that here, we'd lose the connection here because it's using, it's using Wi-Fi and things. So go into airplane mode because you don't need any of that interference you might get from the radio or the Wi-Fi or anything on there. So when you're recording, go to airplane mode. And the other thing that you might want to consider 
is turning off your background app refresh. So if you come in here, just type back, it'll go to background app refresh and turn all of that off. So at the moment I've got it on for a whole bunch of apps, but if you just go off to app background app refresh, that means that the apps in the background aren't going to be constantly, which will save you on data, it'll save you on processing, and it can also mean that an app that you're not even running or you don't even think you're running is accessing things in the background. So if you turn that off, that can actually help you out a lot of the time. I'm going to put that onto Wi-Fi only. I don't actually use the mobile data on this iPad, so it's not a problem for me. So there's just a few little tips uh, that, that I thought I would share here because I was about to reply to R uh, Times 2's email and then I thought, hey, I'm doing a Q&A GarageBand show. This seems pretty relevant. So now I can, uh, I can point him to this as the potential solution. Speaking of solutions... Uh, I'm bad at segues, so I don't have a solution to anything. This is the end of the regular stuff for this week for the live shows. We've got some pre-recorded stuff coming your way. This week's podcast is going to be a look back, a highlights package that my daughter's put together of Songtember 2023, of all of the songs that we shared. So if you missed the four and a half hours, and you, I think it's about 25 minutes, so it's a, a little clip, a little snippet of everyone's song. So I thought that was a nice way to, to wrap a little bow on the whole song timber thing also to be doing your music live and the happy hour and all the usual stuff i also wanted to say to my patreon folks uh, next week we'll be doing patreon live i know it's really late we normally do it in the first week of october uh, i i took a holiday and it was the end of song timber and there was a lot going on so apologies to the patreon crew we'll be doing patreon live next week i'll get those streams set up shortly keep an eye on your email it'll be on uh, wednesday morning or tuesday afternoon depending where you are in the world on the 24th or the 25th of October. So yes, we'll be basically be doing two in a row for, for the uh, Patreon. And if you would like to join the Patreon crew, you're more than welcome over there at patreon.com slash Pete Johns. That is going to do it for this one. Thank you everyone for being here. Uh, thank you for all your support. Thanks for those who participated in Song Timber and your music live and who've donated to the channel and who are Patreons. You are all awesome in this uh, topsy-turvy world that we live in. Uh, it is great to have a wonderful community of folks that can help us create, record, and release our best music. Until next time, folks, be kind to yourself, be kind to others, use GarageBand or whatever you like, and I'll see you next time here on Go.